welcome to the Focus on Eye Health Expert Series. I'm Jeff Todd, CEO at Prevent Blindness. Today, we're going to talk about thyroid eye disease with two experts on the topic. Joining me are Dr. Sarah Wester, a professor of ophthalmology at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, and Mr. Stephen Bander, who's himself living with the condition. Let's start with you, Dr. Wester. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your area of expertise? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here for this Focus on Eye Health series. Early on in my career, I got very interested in thyroid eye disease because of one of my patients. Um, I had a patient that was a similar age to myself, and she had very, very disabling disease. And seeing that really made me want to focus my kind of research, translational and clinical research, as well as my clinical practice more on thyroid eye disease to try and help improve diagnosis and treatment. And you mentioned that you're an ocu oculo, excuse me, an oculoplastic surgeon. Oh, that's a tough one to say. Um, could you describe a little bit about what that entails? And is this um, the primary um, specialty that deals with thyroid eye disease? So we treat basically anything around the eye or on the surface of the eye. So that includes the eyelids. We do cosmetic and functional surgery. If you have a droopy eyelid or if you just don't like the way the lower upper eyelids look, we do surgery for that. And then we also focus on orbital disease, whether it's orbital tumors or thyroid eye disease, as we'll talk about, is the disease of the orbit, the tissue behind the eye and around the eye. And also tearing problems, lacrimal surgery, um, and a lot of reconstructive surgery. So it really runs the gamut for a highly subspecialized field. I feel like we got to do lots of different things, which makes it very, very interesting. Um, we are often the folks that treat thyroid eye disease, but there are a lot of other players involved. So neuro-ophthalmologists that deal with the optic nerve and nerve problems around the eye, they often treat thyroid eye disease as well. Typically, they do more of the medical management, but there are some neuro-ophthalmologists that do surgical interventions as well. And then there's another subspecialty, which is strabismus surgery or pediatric ophthalmology. And that's a specialist that focuses on the eye muscle. So they do surgery when there's double vision and the eye muscle itself is off. They do surgery to kind of fix the position of the eye or move those eye muscles. And then of course we work with primary care and endocrinology. And I think that's a big, big part of treating thyroid eye disease is working closely with the endocrinologist as we'll talk about in a little bit, I hope is just you know, the importance of patients having good systemic thyroid control, the importance of us understanding how it's being managed, because all of it affects the eyes and people that have thyroid eye disease. You know, here at Prevent Blindness, as we've been doing more education around this condition, um, I've certainly learned that there's really a misunderstanding that oftentimes thyroid eye disease is, is viewed as a symptom of Graves' disease. When, when it's actually a disease of its own, could you talk a little bit about that distinction? So it's really important to realize that thyroid eye disease can exist at the same time. It can be an extra thyroidal manifestation, meaning outside of the thyroid of Graves' disease. And there are other ones. People can get swelling in their legs or pretibial myxedema. There are other manifestations, but it's one of those. But it doesn't mean you have to have Graves' disease. So we see people, the majority have Graves' disease for sure, but we see people that have hypothyroidism and then some that are youth thyroid, meaning totally normal thyroid function, and they have the eye manifestation. So we really have to see this as a separate disease in that in some patients, you know, we are treating them before they actually get diagnosed with the systemic dysfunction. At the same time, it's really important that we know that when people have Graves' disease and get post-treatment hypothyroidism, they go low, or they have hyperthyroidism, that can portend a worse prognosis in terms of the eye function. So we have to kind of work with endocrinology, seeing that this is an extra thyroidal manifestation, but also be aware that it's not always linked to the Graves' disease. And I've seen patients with totally stable disease for 20 years, no change in systemic th um, thyroid function, and have an exacerbation of their eye disease. And so we know that something separate is going on in the orbit. So what are some of the early symptoms that someone might experience um, with thyroid eye disease? I think it's really important to think about severity and activity. So early in the disease tends to be mild symptoms, um, then we get moderate and severe symptoms, and then activity. Some people can have very active disease and it's important to, to recognize that as well. In the beginning, one of the things that's really hard about this disease and one of the things that makes it important that the person treating patients really has seen a lot of thyroid eye disease is the heterogeneity of disease. People, no two patients look just alike. You know, if I have a droopy eyelid, I have a droopy eyelid. It's pretty straightforward. But with thyroid eye disease, the clinical manifestations really can run the gamut. 
um, of how they present. So some patients will present and look like they have allergies. It's red eyes, tearing. Um, they can have itching, even dry eyes. And those are symptoms early on. And it often gets misdiagnosed. I can't tell you how many people I've seen that have been misdiagnosed as having allergic conjunctivitis or allergies. They see allergy specialists, they go on you know, allergy treatment, it doesn't get better. As the disease progresses, we see some of the more classic findings like eyelid retraction, which is one of the most classic findings of thyroid eye disease. That's when the eyelid kind of pulls up, um, the upper lid's too high and the lower lid's too low. And it gives the, the layman's term is the thyroid stare, but it just gives that appearance of the eyes being more open. And sometimes even without the eye bulging forward, that can make it look like it's bulging forward. But then you add to it in some patients that get the bulging of the eyelid, what we know as proptosis or exophthalmus. And that leads to pressure sensation, a pulling sensation on those muscles behind the eye. It can be very uncomfortable. I'll let Mr. Bander talk about that because he has more personal experience with it. But from what my patients share, it really is uncomfortable. And often after treatment or after surgery, they say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how bad that was until it got better. It can be quite uncomfortable. It can be also double vision as we get kind of more in the moderate to severe disease where the muscles are more affected, they don't move well. So if you think about it, if one eye is kind of moving this way and the other eye is moving differently, we're gonna see two images on the retina of each eye. And so we're gonna have double images and that's why we get double vision. Now, it can be very disabling. It's hard to drive with double vision. It's hard to work with double vision. It's extremely hard to function. Again, I'll let Mr. Bander talk about that. But as you get the progression of the orbital inflammation, you know, all of the redness and the swelling can get worse and worse. And some people just present with eyelid edema or swelling. And I've had patients, many patients come in for a lower lid blepharoplasty, which is surgery to fix the bags under the eyelid that I've looked at and said, you have thyroid eye disease and we've diagnosed right there in the chair. Um, so I think it's really important that we recognize it can present a variety of different ways. And sometimes people just come in and say, my eyes feel irritated, they're dry, they don't feel right. And that can be an early sign. And the earlier we catch it, obviously the better we can do to manage um, the disease. Are we seeing thyroid eye disease in, at higher rates among certain populations? And there are some things we can modify. There's what we call modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. One of the things we can't change um, is our age, gender and age, and those are two risk factors. So females are more likely to get thyroid eye disease than males, but males tend to get worse disease. Um, it's thought to be related possibly to the estrogen um, presence in females, but we, you know, there's a lot that has not been well elucidated yet. Other risk factors that we can modify, smoking, okay, obstructive sleep apnea. So smoking has a seven times increased risk of having worse thyroid eye disease. And I will tell you, the patients that are smokers, worse risk of severe disease, um, quitting smoking really helps. And this even um, pertains to secondhand smoke. So if the partner smokes, it's really important you talk to them about, about stopping smoking. Um, selenium, low selenium levels in Europe where the uh, selenium is not as rich in the diet, we see that low selenium levels are associated with progression of disease. So sometimes selenium supplementation is needed. Same thing with vitamin D. Lower vitamin D was shown to be associated with worse disease. So sometimes we supplement that. And then serum cholesterol levels um, have been associated with it as well. So things like that we can manage like that. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea. People with obstructive sleep apnea have a higher risk of compressive optic neuropathy and worsening disease. So all of these things are things we can control. And then, the, you know, the gender, um, the age, as we get older, we have an increased risk of relapse or worse disease. Um, and then systemic thyroid management. So this is where it's really important we work with our endocrinologists, because if we have um, issues with hypothyroidism, especially post-treatment, post-radioactive iodine, we know that that can lead to an exacerbation of the disease. So when we see people with active disease, we tend to kind of guide them towards different management of their systemic thyroid disease. And then working really closely with our endocrinologist, sometimes I'll see a patient and I say, boy, I just feel you're reactivating. Let's check your levels. And sure enough, um, their, their levels are off. So I think it's really important that we kind of work together um, and help patients with that. So what are um, some of the common treatments for thyroid disease. You can break it up into kind of medical management or surgical management, and that's going to de depend obviously on disease severity and disease activity. Some patients will have very mild disease. They'll be treated with artificial tears, lubrication, sleeping with your head elevated, and that really has to do with gravitational forces and more swelling that happens if you're lying flat, and they'll do fine. 
and that's it. And that's, that's wonderful. But in the patients that have more moderate to severe disease, that's where we really want to focus on treating. And typically the teaching has been, we want to treat early because that's when you have this whole inflammatory cascade. So we can treat it with some of these diseases that target that. Um, so traditionally, uh, we used to treat with what was called the Cahaley protocol, which is IV steroids. Okay. And there's doses, there's different dosing regimens, but you give it weekly for 12 weeks to try and decrease the inflammation. But one of the problems with that was kind of the side effects and the recurrence or relapse rate. And then there were many patients I found and others have found that just didn't respond. Other treatments we use like tazolizumab, rituximab have also been shown to have benefit in certain patients that failed uh, steroids. And in, in certain places, people are still using those treatments, especially in Europe where uh, tepertumumab is not available. Tepertumumab is the first FDA approved therapy for thyroiditis disease. And that's a monoclonal antibody against a receptor, the IGF-1 receptor. And that receptor is shown to be in the orbit and it works with that TSH receptor. So if you think about it, it's like these same antibodies that are attacking the thyroid go and attack the tissue in the orbit. And in the orbit, they bind to these receptors. So if we can block that receptor, hopefully we can block a lot of the downstream things that happen, like the swelling of the tissue, the swelling of the muscles, the fat expansion that pushes the eye out, makes it hard for the eye to move. So that's where tepertumumab came in is because it was shown that IGF-1, this receptor was present there. So by blocking that receptor, it was thought that this would help. And sure enough, studies showed a significant benefit in terms of the swelling or the activity, as well as the proptosis and the bulging. Um, that's an IV infusion given every three weeks, uh, eight infusions are given. And the first studies that were done really looked at people early on in the disease. So in the first nine months of diagnosis, within nine months of diagnosis with significant activity of disease. But now there are studies looking at different subsets, people that have more chronic disease to see if there's some benefit, because actually it's been shown that these receptors still exist in those chronic disease patients. It's not just targeting the immune response. It's actually working um, kind of on a more molecular level at the underlying disease um, pathophysiology. So, so that's one of the treatments that we use. And then radiation has been looked at as well. And some people advocate for radiation, especially in people that have compression of the nerve where the tissue swells so much that it kind of pushes on that nerve, which means you can have blindness actually in vision loss. It's like the telephone cord, someone's stepping on it, you know, the signaling is not going to go through. And if you think about the confined bony orbit, there's not that much space, the tissue expands. And so it presses on important structures like those nerves. Um, in some cases, or after disease has been stable, we'll do surgery. Uh, we do it when someone has that compression of the optic nerve and, and the, tr the medical treatments fail, then we'll do surgery. But most often we like to wait until someone's stable and we're treating it for the bulging or the lids that are pulled up. We treat that with surgery or the swelling and the fat prolapse. Patients get a lot of fat prolapse that we see with age, but we see it happen much more quickly in thyroid eye disease patients. So we're trying to kind of restore them as closely as we can to how they were before. Well, Steve, I'd like to bring you into this conversation now as, as a patient, um, as someone who's living with thyroid eye disease, could you tell us a little bit about the condition and, and how it's impacting you? Right. Uh, right now, I'm in an inactive phase, of Ted, I believe. And, but you can clearly see the resulting uh, proptosis in my right eye. You can also slight, probably see it in my left eye, too. Um, and so now, so I'm basically completed the disease process. And um, in terms of the conditions, uh, it, I, I think it really, Ted or thyroid eye disease really began for me about two years after I was first diagnosed with Graves' disease. I would notice when I woke up in the morning and looked in the mirror that my eyes were just so bulged out and irritated and red. I also, when I was outside, started to really feel uh, light sensitive. Uh, uh, there, my, um, it just, uh, my eyes would hurt from the from sunlight, which it shouldn't have. And, um, and I also, as Dr. Wester was mentioning, I just started tearing for no reason. Uh, just tears would just start rolling down my cheek either while I was sitting watching television or um, uh, taking a walk. And uh, so, those were the initial things that I, I started to feel. Uh, but it got progressively worse uh, to much more severe bulging than what I had noticed at the beginning, and which a lot of people would tell me was 
not noticeable to them. Uh, my incredibly dry, dry eyes uh, um, where you wake up in the morning and they're basically like glued shut and you have to um, uh, really, and it takes, it takes effort and there's a little bit of pain to open your eyes. Um, again, uh, going and looking at yourself first thing in the morning, even when you would sleep with um, a pillow or um, elevated, um, uh, your eyes would still be bulged out. And it was just, it's always a kind of a frightening sight first thing in the morning to see that. Um, but the most debilitating symptom that happened, that started to happen was the double vision, as Dr. Wester was talking about. Um, it uh, really uh, caused, it causes tremendous confusion when you're trying to think um, or when you're thinking while talking to someone and then, the, and then it, they start moving. Um, it creates headaches and just tremendous fatigue. Um, and the debilitating condition of double vision um, and, and really also the dry eyes really were improved by the Tepeza um, infusions that Dr. Wester mentioned. So that's my condition, but I'm now in an inactive phase, I believe, and, what, and I will shortly um, have plastic surgery to um, restore uh, what my eyes look like before uh, the proptosis and the disease. Was this a condition you'd heard of before you were diagnosed with thyroid eye disease? I had not at all. Um, I was diagnosed with Graves disease around 2016 by my general practitioner, Dr. Duncan Garcia, um, after she had noticed something on one of my uh, labs from my annual physical. So she sent me to um, go to radiology and I was confirmed to have Graves disease. And I was then sent to an, a specialist, an endocrinologist who, uh, and the, uh, our strategy was that I would take medicine uh, for the protocol before getting my, to see if I would go into remission for Graves disease, but he never mentioned to me uh, thyroid eye disease. It took until my next annual physical with Dr. Garcia, uh, Duncan Garcia, where she said to me in response to my Graves disease, have you gone to get your eyes checked? And I said, I have not. She said, oh, you must. You, if you have Graves disease, you need to get your eyes checked you need to make an appointment immediately. So I made an appointment at Baskin Palmer, um, which is uh, the top eye institute um, and, and happens to be not far from where I live. And uh, the doctor that was um, did the initial examination said to me at the conclusion, um, you know, there wasn't anything, uh, I wasn't really manifesting the symptoms of thyroid eye disease at that point took about, I think, another year, but said, you need to start supplementing with selenium now. Um, and uh, then explained to me thyroid eye disease. And um, I, uh, the next thing was probably about a year later when the symptoms got started, with the light sensitivity, um, waking up with these swollen eyes, um, that I realized that I needed to go back to Baskin Palmer. Um, and I made an appointment with a specialist in thyroid eye disease, which is doc, who was Dr. Wester. And um, that was um, and when I started being under her care. So. It just, it amazes me how often we hear this disconnect. There's so much education that needs to be done among professionals and the public about the importance of early detection and, and early connection to eye care for patients living with Graves' disease and other related conditions. So thank you for sharing that. You know, one of the things we hear a lot among pa the patient population in this area is the emotional or mental health impact that this condition has. Could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how this condition has made you um, feel about yourself, yourself or others, or how you've engaged in society in different ways, or has it had that, an impact on? Oh, for sure, it's had an impact. Um, uh, it, uh, for a lot of reasons, not just the uh, external appearance, but also just how you feel. I mean, uh, 
uh, you're tired, you can't think straight. Um, uh, it's, uh, um, you're, you can get confused. Uh, uh, you can't enjoy simple things of with, when the double vision uh, with that condition, watching television, exercising becomes a chore. Like uh, my, uh, the personal trainer I used always knew when I was suffering from double vision because she could see me squinting. Um, so I, uh, uh, and as, so it's bad. Um, I would tell you, it made me self-conscious for sure. That's with just the appearance with the, um, the symptoms, as I was saying, going back, um, it affects your sleep. Um, it affects um, your alertness. Uh, as I said, it affects um, uh, with the double vision, even when you don't, as I think Dr. Wester was saying, even when you're not, um, you're still kind of suffering it um, all the time, even when you think you're not suffering from double vision. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it's draining. Uh, it's a total energy journey. Well, thank you for opening up and sharing sharing that with us. Um, Dr. Wester, could I ask you to add a little bit from, from a professional's experience about your observations of the impact, of the psychosocial impact of this condition? First of all, thank you so much for sharing that, Mr. Bander. I know that's so hard. And I would just add that, you know, the studies show that the quality of life effect on these patients is similar to cancer. And I think that's often underestimated or underappreciated. You know, I think everything he just shared, imagine waking up one day and looking in the mirror and you don't look like yourself. And it's, it's really life altering for patients. I, you know, it goes back to that first woman, she was my age and she couldn't drive her kids to school and she's managing a job and life. And one day she wakes up and everybody thinks she's angry because her eyes are bulging and they're retracted and everybody's looking at her and she can't even drive her kids to school. And it really just touched me so much um, how much that is life-changing. And in the context of everything that he shared about the Graves disease and feeling tired and depressed and anxious from the Graves disease, you put that all together and it really is extremely hard for patients. Mental health is a really important aspect of this. And I often talk to patients about you know, support groups online, um, there's more awareness, which is great. And also, you know, getting a therapist, if you feel comfortable talking to a therapist, because again, quality of life is like cancer. This is a real, um, very, very hard disease to deal with. And because it's not as prevalent, there's less awareness. And so I just hope with more awareness, there'll be more support for patients going through this. Um, because some of the stories I've heard have been really, really just awful to hear that they've been dealing with. It's, it's you know, one of the things that we hear from patients all the time, and I know this isn't just true of eye health patients, is, you know, they, they don't know what to ask their doctors. You know, what do you think are some of the basic first line questions that a patient should ask their doctor when, when diagnosed with this condition? I think asking about risk factors is key, right? What risk factors do I have? How, what can I do? Uh, there's unfortunately a lot of this is out of your control, but, but understanding that which is in your control can be helpful. Those things that you can do to help yourself is really, really important. And then also what about the systemic management? So as I was saying before, it does matter how you're treated systemically and we know that. And so just a little, you know, I'm not an endocrinologist, so I defer to them, but a short conversation about what we do know is important. I really like to bring out my diagram. I wish I had like an eyeball here because everything makes a lot more sense visually. I'm a visual person myself. So just understanding what happens. Why is this happening? Because you know, understanding the anatomy. We have a confined bony orbit. It's like an ice cream cone. So if you try and stuff too much ice cream in there, there's no space. The ice cream is going to start coming out the top, right? We'll have the scoops at the top. There's only so much you can put in there. And that's kind of a good analogy, but showing a diagram, what happens to the muscles? Why am I seeing double? I think is really, really helpful. So I think it's important to talk about those things. And then also just be open and honest about the mental health piece. You know, this is how this is affecting me. And hopefully having a compassionate doctor that, that spends a minute to say, look, these, you know, I can share my experience with other patients and what they've done that's been helpful for themselves. So I think each patient kind of has their own journey, but the more that they can be supported around 
um, communities, you know, chat groups, um, forums, education, and then and mental health is is really important. The number one thing is you may be fine, and you may be fine when you say, okay, you're not, you don't have um, right now any evidence of moderate disease, maybe of mild disease. But if you notice something's different, you go back. And so I think having that conversation with the physician, what do I do if something changes, is really important because. The last thing you want to do is just say, well, I'm going to wait for six months and live with this and be really quite miserable without, you know, that's what we're here for. Steve, could you share a little bit about any resources that have helped you um, address this condition personally outside of your healthcare providers? Psychotherapy, I think, is incredibly valuable for counseling while you're doing, while you're going through this, um, because often you feel uh, you can even when talking to your own family and friends about the symptoms, sometimes you feel like you're being gaslit, that when you're talking about the bulging eyes, people are polite to you. Oh, I don't see anything different, or they look the same to me, or uh, maybe a little. Uh, it doesn't feel that way to the person. I mean, they are extremely bugged out, I think, in the mind of the person that has the disease. Uh, and so when you're in counseling, which is really talking to yourself, it gives you a very, starts to give you a, a different perspective on this because um, as Dr. Wester always says, it will come to an end, like, and she will be able to um, return you to look the way that you originally looked um, before the disease, but you've got to wait. And so it's really putting, to me, mindfulness, and as I was talking about, like um, uh, that was another thing that uh, psychotherapy helps. Psychotherapy helps, and then also I got into mindfulness, really. That was with the ex physical exercise and recovery from the exercise. Could you share a little bit more about now that, that you've received an appropriate diagnosis and are receiving regular treatment, what your hopes for the future are? With this condition? I think I've made it through. Um, uh, I um, am scheduled shortly at the beginning of November for uh, the orbital decompression surgery, which will then be followed up by eyelid surgery. Um, and uh, the symptoms of the double vision and the dryness really subsided and uh, were gone after I completed uh, the Tepezit infusions, which were, there are eight of them over, I think, a five-month period. Um, and uh, my eighth was on August 6th, uh, which happened to be my birthday, and uh, August 6, 2021. And I um, have not thought since about double vision. It doesn't come up in my mind uh, uh, anymore. Uh, same thing with um, waking up in the morning. My eyes are not swollen like they used to be. They're not irritated. They're not glued shut. So I'm feeling pretty good. Is there anything else, Dr. Wester, you'd like to, to leave us with as we wrap this up? No, I just am very excited that there's more awareness about this. I would leave us with just the notion, you know, we have an FDA approved treatment that you know, certainly there are adverse events associated with any treatment, side effects of any treatment. Um, but in terms of proptosis, that bulging and the double vision, it's very exciting how many patients get relief and improvement. And we're learning a lot now that it's in clinical practice about you know, how long does it last? What's the risk of recurrence and things like that. And we have lots of new studies going on. You know, there, we're looking at the same medication for people with chronic disease and there are other new medications coming out. So I think whereas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first started and it was really watch and wait for a long, long time, we're in this new era where there's more awareness, there's treatment options and the treatment options are so much better than they were. And as we understand more of the actual disease process, um, and the molecular underpinnings of the disease, we could target things. So hopefully less side effects, you know, um, than we used to. Um, so that's, it's an exciting time. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and for um, Stephen Bander to share his experience, because I think that speaks more than anything else to what, what this is about. Well, thank you both so much for, for joining me today. I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot. And uh, 
have learned a lot myself. And for anyone listening, please visit preventblindness.org. Um, go to our thyroid eye disease awareness page and you'll um, have a lot of information and resources you can tap into. Thank you.